I was furious, and I'm still angry about it. So that's my little experience of 68 and the process <laughs> that we went through. George, um, uh, tell us your recollections of what 68 meant to you, the conventions, how it's changed. We just want to hear from you. Well, I suppose the uh, first thing I should do is explain why I became a presidential candidate for 18 days in uh, 19... 68. Um, we had a three-way primary in South Dakota that year, presidential primary, Hubert Humphrey, Gene McCarthy, and Robert uh, Kennedy. The South Dakota primary was the same day as California's. And uh, that night, the returns from South Dakota came in, and Robert Kennedy had over 50% of the vote, more than uh, Jane and Hubert uh, uh, combined, notwithstanding the fact that Hubert was born in South Dakota and lived his first 26 years in that state. His father finally convinced him that if he was interested in politics as a Democrat, he should get out of South Dakota, <laughs> that there's no way you're going to see a Democrat elected to any substantive high office in uh, that state. So Hubert went to Minnesota. Gene McCarthy was born in North Dakota, but was uh, known well by uh, South Dakota. So this was quite a remarkable victory for um, a senator from Massachusetts to come into that uh, state and in a rather hard-fought primary uh, win over 50 percent uh, of the vote. Um, I told, I called Ted Kennedy that night. He was in San Francisco and Bobby was in Los Angeles. And I said, you know, it's an interesting thing, Ted, in some of the Indian precincts in South Dakota, your uh, brother got 100% of the vote, not 99.9, 100% in a number of those Indian precincts. I said, I never did that. I always carried the Indian vote, but never by 100%. Uh, percent. Uh, so you might pass that on. And he said, why don't you call Bobby? He didn't tell him that directly. So I did. And um, the uh, next morning when some photographer had taken a picture of the things that were on the podium where Senator Kennedy spoke when he went down to accept his win in California was a little note. George says 100%. Indian vote. So I was glad he got that uh, uh, information. But a few days later, after he was killed, a group of his top staff members and several of his key delegates came to see me and asked if I would assume the leadership of the 143 delegates that Senator Kennedy had won in California, South Dakota. I said, I can't do that. I'm right in the middle of a campaign for re-election to the Senate in uh, South Dakota. You guys probably know that I came to the Senate with a margin of 118 votes on um, election night, 1962. My opponent did what I would have done. He called for a recount, and I won finally by 597 votes. But I can't afford to jeopardize my uh, re-election um, for a symbolical gesture of this kind. Well, to make a long story short, they kept after me. Elner and I accepted an invitation to go to the World Council of Churches in Uppsala, Sweden. I thought I could hide there and nobody would locate me. When I landed in London a week later, here were the uh, people from 60 minutes waiting for me. What about your run for the presidency? So I jumped into that and um, had 18 days before the convention. All the delegates had been decided. So there was no way to, to uh, change that. But as Haynes uh, said, uh, this was a memorable time, that uh, convention. I had the support of a few well-known people, including Senator Abe Ribicoff, and he and I called on Mayor Daley. 
to see if he might throw in his support since I was heading up the Kennedy delegation. But we discovered rather soon that Mayor Daley's candidate was Ted Kennedy, and he was pressing Ted to uh, come into the uh, race. Uh, so we didn't get support there. But the next day, when uh, uh, Senator Rubikoff was nominating me for the presidency, he threw out a line that I guess every documentary on 68 now refers to when he said, with George McGovern as president, we wouldn't have Gestapo tactics uh, in the streets of Chicago. We wouldn't have to have a National Guard called out to restore uh, order. And this led to an explosion of Mayor Daley, understandably. Keep in mind, he was a good, longtime friend of Abe Rivikoff's. They had worked together on John Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1960 and had kept in touch uh, ever since then. So these were uh, emotions operating on that convention floor that separated friend from friend, ally from ally, and it was indeed an explosive time. The mayor, I won't go into the language because I'm not a, a lip reader, but the uh, people who are uh, left no doubt that the mayor was giving his blast at Abe Rubikoff with everything he had. After that convention ended, and it was indeed an explosive uh, convention, that's the only word I can, uh, I can use for it, there were two developments that uh, significantly affected me one was that that convention, with the support of the Humphrey delegates, the McCarthy delegates, and the Kennedy delegates, who were then my delegates, all of them agreed that we had to do something about the nominating process. The situation that created all the tension there in Chicago was you had all these political activists in the streets Many of them had worked hard in the McCarthy campaign or the Kennedy campaign, and they found themselves excluded from the campaign. And the more they began to dig into how you get to be a delegate, the more they realized it was a closed operation, uh, tightly held by white, middle-class, middle-aged males. I'm not against people like that. I was one myself, a white, middle-class, middle-aged male in 1968. But uh, it was clear that that didn't really represent the American people as a whole. And so this Reform Commission was mandated by the 68 election again I was talked into being the chairman. I, I'm a history teacher, and I, I know a little bit about what happens to reformers. Uh, you, you, you're bound to alienate everybody who likes the situation as it is. And that's quite a few people who don't want to see change. But we knew that we had to make changes after 68, and so... Um, Somewhat reluctantly, but under pressure from Senator Humphrey, then Vice President Humphrey, and um, Walter Ruther, one of the leading labor uh, leaders, Fred Harris, Senator Fred Harris, who was the Democratic National Chairman, I agreed to chair this committee of 28 people. I think the reforms that we developed saved the Democratic Party, and in a sense, made a great contribution to a democracy uh, in the United States. We didn't come up with a formula to, to guarantee that we'd have better presidential nominees. What we did guarantee is that there would be a broader representation in that selection, that women, for example, would have an equal shot at being a nominating delegate that uh, black people, Hispanic people, young people, 
all of these people who had been largely excluded would be brought in uh, to the nominating um, uh, process. We held our first public hearing in Chicago, and Mayor Daley was the lead-off witness. Uh, he told me that morning, he said, George, you have to be a little careful about your moves from uh, here on in because the nominee in 72 is either going to be young Kennedy, as he called Ted, or you. I said, oh, I don't know about that, Mayor. He said, well, no. He says, that's the way I see it. I think that uh, you made a great impression here in this convention, and I think that's the way it's going to go. So you better be careful about these reforms because uh, they're very touchy. But then he proceeded to come out without hesitation for a primary election. We hadn't... We hadn't recommended primaries in the committee. We said we'd accept primaries, caucuses, or conventions as long as the delegate selection process was open to women, open to young people, open to blacks, to Hispanics. Uh, we uh, will accept that. Uh, many of the states did adopt uh, primaries, Illinois being one of them under uh, Mayor Daley's uh, uh, leadership. Now, there's one other thing that I'll mention here, and then we'll turn to David uh, Broder. Um, uh, this is something, maybe I'm the only one in the room that is aware of the significance of this. There was a debate sponsored by the California delegation at that 1968 convention involving Hubert Humphrey, Gene McCarthy, and myself. And the debate centered largely on the war in Vietnam. This was an issue that I probably knew as much about as anyone uh, in the Senate. And to come right to the point, I won that debate heads down. There wasn't any doubt about it. There was no doubt in my mind, in Hubert's mind, in Gene's mind, or in any of the audience. It was on all the networks and carried uh, where millions of Americans uh, saw it. It may have been the most constructive thing that happened in that convention, but it very quietly elevated me into a a national stature I never had before that. That plus the 18-day run for the um, uh, nomination after all the delegates had picked uh, probably did as much as anything to open the way for me to be an effective candidate for the presidency uh, later on. Uh, I, I'm not among those who think the decade of the 1960s was a bad decade. I think it was a creative, uh, sig historically significant uh, decade that brought millions of new people into the political process. It demonstrated the power of direct political uh, action. It made people aware of some of the great issues before the country. Of course, it was a tragedy to lose Martin Luther King and John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, Medgar Evers, and others that were shot down in that decade. But out of it all, we not only got powerful civil rights legislation, we forced an end to the war in uh, Vietnam, and we opened up the political process to people who'd never dreamed that they would be in on the selection of a presidential nominee. I think the decade of the 1960s was essentially uh, a creative and worthy one. I think the so-called McGovern-Fraser reforms were wonderful. I thought that then, I still do today, and apparently most of my party does, because there's no really serious effort uh, to change them. We can get into the superdelegates later on, but uh, 
Those are just a few quick observations that I had to share with you. <clears throat> and let, let me say that it's a treasure to sit by Haynes Johnson and uh, David Broder. Um, they're two objective, uh, marvelous uh, journalists that I have treasured all of my public life. These people know us too well, Senator, to believe that. But uh, <laughs> uh, the 68 and 72 conventions in which you played such a significant part were very divisive uh, in the after uh, effects on the Democratic Party. Uh, now we are engaged in another, about to have another convention. Uh, in the past uh, several months, you have been a supporter of both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Uh, do you think the Democrats can afford to let Senator Clinton's name go in nomination? <clears throat> well, I don't know that uh, Senator Clinton is even thinking about that. She's going to address the uh, convention on Tuesday night, am I not right? Uh, and I think that's a good thing. But I don't see the point in having a roll call. Uh, we had that in 72. It seemed like it took all night. And we had all kinds of people being nominated for vice president, including uh, <laughs> Shirley MacLaine and Dan Rather and everybody else who was in the room. So I think all that would do would be to take up a lot of time and uh, Hillary's going to make a great speech at the convention on Tuesday. Uh, if I had anything to say about it, I would uh, think that's probably sufficient. She has a lot of uh, supporters across the country of whom I was uh, one until it became clear to me that uh, she couldn't close the gap with uh, Barack Obama. And then I thought it was time to close ranks and get ready to take on uh, Senator McCain. <clears throat> uh, George, let me come back to the question of reforms. There's no, no doubt that in history's verdict, uh, as David wrote, uh, uh, what you did in 68 led to the possibilities that we now see of a woman and an African-American candidate that opened the doors and so forth. But if you look at the convention, the political process now, do you think we need other reforms on the, the length of the time? Should we have regional primaries uh, instead of just this? We've now gone through two years of an elongated process, not over yet before the conventions. Are there other reforms needed now to tighten the process? Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I don't see the need for that. Um, um, I think that... Um, these reforms uh, have worked very well. Uh, we accepted one change in the reform rules, kind of as a reaction uh, against them. It was proposed by some delegates that there be a, a percentage of the delegates that were automatically selected. Let me just tell you one of the things that produced that feeling. I think uh, a 20-year-old uh, McGovern young woman delegate candidate defeated Tip O'Neill in his home district of Cambridge in 72. Avril Harriman had difficulty getting to the uh, convention. Uh, Clark Clifford, people like that. And so it was proposed that a percentage of the delegates be automatically picked. Those are the people that are now, now being called super delegates. If you were a prominent senator in your state or you were a governor or you were a state chairman, uh, whatever, uh, you could be named as a super delegate without competing for the job. And we did that this year. I guess, what, 25% uh, super uh, delegates. Uh, to everybody's surprise, I accepted that idea. They thought I would fight it tooth and nail. But I accepted that in, um, as I recall, 1982. Uh, and so after 10 years of the McGovern rules, we had the first significant change, and that was to add these 
superdelegates. I thought it was a good idea then, I still do to this day, but I don't see what other changes there are necessary. I'm against the idea of a national primary, I suppose partly because of my own experience in coming out of nowhere and working my tail off uh, to win that nomination in 72. I really spent time in Iowa and New Hampshire and Wisconsin and Massachusetts. I won 11 important uh, primaries. That compares favorably with the five that were won by my friend John Kennedy. But I don't see what other changes we can legislate that, uh, that make much uh, sense. <clears throat> I, I don't even think these long races are all that bad. Uh, I had a hard time coming to the conclusion between Hillary and, and uh, Barack, and uh, it took a long time, but I think it was worth the wait. Dave, you want to answer that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the uh, panel where I heard you on Sunday, uh, former Senator Adlai Stevenson, as you know, uh, complained that uh, the nominating process has become virtually an auction, that money is what really drives it now. What's your take on that proposition? I think there's some truth that money uh, drives our politics. Um, I like the idea of uh, federal money and the assurance that people will not seek uh, private support uh, beyond that, but um, that's a, that I think is a long ways off before we have that kind of thing. I think money does play a big part in our politics. In 1972, I ran for the nomination for two years. If you don't like this long process, I'm one of the reasons for it. Um, up until that time, nobody had announced a year ahead of the election year, but I knew if I was to get that nomination, I had to start early and work harder than these better known uh, candidates. But um, um, I spent $32 million. That included winning 11 state primaries I had to pay for the National Convention because the Democratic National Committee had no money. So my campaign paid for the convention in uh, Miami. I wouldn't say that we had bought the convention, but we, uh, we paid for it. Um, and uh, third, I had to run in the general election against an incumbent president, Mr. Nixon, the whole thing for two years, $32 million. Now. Barack and Hillary spent that in a month on the way to winning the uh, nomination. I wish we did have some control over the money, but every time you try that, you run against the First Amendment that says we have unfettered free speech, and that includes the right to buy time on television and do other things. I think it's a, a tough problem. I have to ask you, here we're meeting in the National Press Club in a room full of journalists and so forth, and uh, what's your sense of how news coverage has changed and affected the political process, the conventions, uh, then to now? I mean, what, what's uh, pluses and minuses? When you look at the coverage of, of politicians, politics, conventions, uh, we have all these cable outlets and so forth probably in the room here, uh, but uh, what, what do you take, what's your take on that? Well, <clears throat> it is a fact that we have saturation coverage on candidates these uh, days. You would have three or four thoughtful people examining what it meant that Hillary shed a tear in uh, New Hampshire. What did that mean? Was it, has she become more human? Has she broken under the strain? And these discussions would go on, sometimes in great uh, depth. Uh, what did Barack mean by um, a quote that he gave that seemed odd? I think the, 
you, you can't, you, when you've got all these cables and all the networks and everybody else competing for a, a breakthrough, you get enormous coverage on the details of a campaign. I personally would like to see more thoughtful debates uh, between the candidates. I've always regretted that President Nixon refused to debate me in 72. Not that I'm the world's greatest uh, debater, but I was a varsity debater both in high school and college. I did win national honors in debate competition. And I think it would have been useful to the uh, public, useful to me and, and uh, to everyone if we had had those debates. I'd like to see more of that instead of these little 30-second spots and then the minute picking into the personal lives of uh, uh, candidates. Um, I've just finished a book on the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. We might never have heard of Abraham Lincoln had it not been for the Douglas-Lincoln debates, seven of them across uh, Illinois. Lincoln lost that race for the Senate, but it made him a national uh, uh, figure. Um, and I, uh, I think it was too bad that in 72, uh, I, people ask me if I have, if I uh, have terrible regrets about losing in 72. I don't regret losing as much as I do the conviction that the American people got a distorted picture of me as they did of Nixon. Uh, neither of those distortions were very accurate. They saw me as weak on defense because I thought we ought to re-examine uh, military spending. They called me the candidate of the three A's, uh, acid, amnesty, and abortion, which was nonsense. Uh, my position on acid is that I was against the legal legalization of hard drugs, uh, except I would change the penalty for a first possession of marijuana from a felony to a misdemeanor. That had the merit of keeping our jails and penitentiaries from being filled up with teenagers. I... Um, on amnesty, I was asked about that. I said, not as long as the war is in progress. The draft is the law of the land. Once the war ends, I would provide an amnesty both for those who had planned the war and uh, those who had opposed it. But uh, as long as it's the law of the land, if you don't want to go, you should be prepared to go to jail as Martin Luther King did for his convictions, or Thoreau, or others. Uh, on the abortion thing, I had a very conservative position, leave it up to the states. So that's how I got labeled the candidate of acid, amnesty, uh, and abortion. I made a mistake. I uh, told my staff, look, nobody's going to believe that nonsense. We don't have to answer stuff like that. Well, that was wrong. You do have to answer these negative uh, charges. And we could have brought all of that out in three or four televised debates. So that's what I would uh, like to see in the way of... This would give the news people and everybody else a more constructive uh, field in which to operate. Just to follow up on the debates, uh, as you know, Senator McCain uh, proposed to have roundtable uh, forums with uh, his opponent, uh, Senator Obama, and uh, Senator Obama rejected that. How do you feel about that? Was that a good decision or a bad decision? Well, I feel a little bit uh, shaky advising Barack Obama on anything. I think he's run a brilliant uh, campaign, but um, I was a little surprised that uh, Senator Obama turned down the idea of, of town meetings. I think he'd have done very well in town meetings with Senator uh, McCain. I suppose the reason he turned it down uh, 
is that he has more money because of this wide internet spread that he has, which incidentally I also had working for me, although on a much smaller scale. Uh, and he may have felt, why should I give Senator McCain uh, weekly coverage in prime time on all the news outlets by these uh, joint meetings when uh, I can outspend him in controlling the television uh, time. But I, uh, I, I, I personally think that's exactly the kind of thing we ought to be doing, town meetings, um, debates, discussions. In Nixon's case, he wouldn't even appear on the same platform with me without debates. He wouldn't even appear in the same city where I was uh, campaigning. They watched my schedule pretty uh, closely to make sure there was never a time when the two of us had joint uh, exposure. Uh, judging by the results, I don't know what he was afraid of, but uh, nonetheless, that's the way it was. I think we probably ought to let the people in the audience have a shot at the senator, don't you? And a shot at the two great journalists here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, would you please identify yourself and your affiliation? Yes, sir. Um, Carl Lubsdorf of the Dallas Morning News. And I, as a young, pretty young reporter, I can vouch for what Senator McGovern said about that California debate because I covered it for the AP. And he definitely was the winner of that uh, confrontation, not that it changed anything at the convention. My question, Senator, is this. That at the conventions, we've been talking about real things happened. Um, platforms were debated and voted on. In some cases, candidacies were not fully decided till the convention. Certainly that was the case in both 68 and 72. Now we have conventions at which nothing real happens. All the decisions have been made in advance and they are giant pep rallies. Do conventions still have value and, and what is it? Well, I agree with you that now they're so scripted that you can almost predict what's going to happen from minute to minute. You never see any of the uh, interior workings of differing ideas. There never seems to be anything spontaneous. Uh, extemporaneous might be a better uh, word, and they're far too scripted to suit me. I find them somewhat boring. I try to uh, follow the conventions as closely as I, I can, but uh, nobody was bored in 68 and nobody was bored in 72. Uh, now, that has its dangers, too. As you know, Carl, the, the, um, my acceptance address, probably the best speech I ever made in my life, uh, came at 3 o'clock in, uh, in the morning. I'll never forget Howard K. Smith ambling across the room. To me, it must have been about 4 a.m. by then. I don't think we ever did go to bed that night. But he, I saw him coming, and he said, George, I'm sick at heart. That's about the best acceptance address I've ever heard at a national convention, and nobody heard it, nobody saw it. And that's true, so we don't want that. We want a little order in these things. It was ridiculous for us to allow this horseplay to go on on the convention floor, but we were operating under what I think is a mistaken idea, you have to just let the convention flow and whatever happens, happens. We should have cut off that floor discussion about 9 o'clock uh, Eastern time and uh, I'd given my uh, acceptance address at a decent time. That was the first time that I could address the whole nation for 30 or 40 minutes without interruption with the best thoughts I could bring to bear on the problems before the country. And I've always thought if I had been able to give that address in prime time, <clears throat> we might have been able to survive the confusion over the Eagleton uh, selection. But as it was, the first time the country really had a look at me, I was fumbling around about what the devil to do with the Eagle Eagleton problem. Not, not good TV time. <laughs> Do conventions still have a value? Oh, 
maybe a certain value, but not uh, not what I think a convention should do. I think the public should be allowed to see platform debates and be allowed to uh, see the inner workings of a, of a party. You can do that and still maintain a certain degree of order. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ron Bajans with Kuwait News Agency. Uh, gentlemen, <coughs> since you have such vast knowledge and experience about American politics, I would request, if, if you would be so kind, as to <coughs> predict the outcome of the November 4th election. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm quite serious. And uh, as closely as to the numbers you think, and I, I, I'm well aware that you're going to say, well, we don't know what's going to happen between now and then. But given what you know so far, uh, would you please venture that for the record? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, How about uh, the other oh, oh, excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, <clears throat> not simply because I'm a Democrat and a supporter of it, but I think Barack is going to win this election. I'll be very surprised if he doesn't. I'm not always too reliable on predicting how an election is going to come out, but that's what I think. Would you I think we're looking at a very close election, and uh, I would not make a bet. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, in the back. My name is Don Kirk. I was in uh, Vietnam as a journalist in 68 and 72. 68 with the Washington Star and 72 with uh, the Chicago Tribune. <clears throat> I just wonder if uh, the senator could uh, give us uh, an idea of how much the Vietnam War played into uh, the results of those elections and into those campaigns and uh, how he looks back on the Vietnam War, uh, whether he thinks it was all a terrible mistake or whether he thinks uh, has mixed views about it, how he thinks, uh, it's, how he thinks it's impacting uh, present policy in the Middle East. Uh, on the uh, last question, uh, I've had no change in my view of the war. <clears throat> I agree with uh, former Secretary of, Def of Defense Robert McNamara, one of the chief architects of the war, who said in his recent book it was not only a mistake, it was a tragic mistake. And that's what I think. As soon as we got our army, out of Iraq. The Vietnamese became our friends almost overnight. They're now trading partners. Americans go there on vacations. So I think the war was unnecessary. Uh, I think it was um, uh, an enormous mistake. I, I'm, it's impossible for me to walk along that black marble wall here in Washington on the mall without tearing up. I just think it's unbelievable that we sacrificed 58,000 wonderful, patriotic young Americans in that unnecessary uh, conflict. I used to tell my daughters, uh, who would get discouraged about Vietnam, just remember that sometimes even tragic events in history uh, produce worthwhile results. The convention in Chicago in 86 produced the reforms that are still on the statute books all this, all this time later. Uh, and I said the thing that Vietnam may do is that it's such an obvious blunder that we'll never again go down that war, go down that path. Uh, and, of course, here we're doing essentially the same thing uh, in Iraq all these years later. Uh, it did not figure heavily in the 72 campaign. And one of the reasons for that is that Nixon was steadily withdrawing troops, usually at the rate of 10 to 25,000 at a time, so that most of the troops were out of there by election day. And uh, then you recall the celebrated press conference about two weeks before the election where Secretary Kissinger said, peace is at hand. Uh, 
There are a few little semantic problems to be worked out, but for all practical purposes, we have achieved peace. And I think that further limited the impact of the issue. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Ann Mulkern. I work for the Denver Post. Um, we interviewed many of the, the, the Clinton delegates who talked about how much they think they want a recall, a recall, want a roll call vote. Um, and I also interviewed Gary Hart, who said he thinks it does serve a purpose to allow the backers of, of a person who's lost to, to have their voice be heard. I, I just am wondering if you can elaborate a little on you thinking that if I heard you correctly, that a roll call vote isn't necessary. And I just wanted to sort of put out the idea that could that create the potential for a lack of a roll call vote, more protests, more distractions from what Senator Obama is trying to accomplish? I guess I'm trying to get a sense. Well, I, I can see some therapeutic value in letting <clears throat> Hillary's um, delegates uh, sound off in public with a, with a roll call. I would think, giving her the uh, podium on Tuesday night to speak as long as she wants, uh, would accomplish just as much. She's a brilliant speaker. Uh, she's, um, she'll have that hall standing and applauding. And uh, if, if I were her, I'd advise her to take that route rather than calling the roll. But it's not a, the end of the earth, no matter which way it goes. If, they, if, you, if, if the planners at the convention think there's a better result from having a roll call, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go for it. I have nothing to say about these things anymore, but I think it, uh, I think it would uh, be better to be satisfied with speaking and saying what she wants to say about her race and praising her supporters to the skies, which they deserve. I thought she did that very well when she came out for Senator Obama. So it sounds like you think it's, it's up to, to Senator Clinton, should be up to Senator Clinton to sort of set yeah, the, I, I the think Yeah, I think her wishes will be carefully uh, considered by the convention managers. Sir? I'm Al Isley, editor of the Hill newspaper. Uh, I have the distinction of having been the only Washington correspondent for, us, for a South Dakota newspaper uh, when you were in the Senate, so we go back a long way. Uh, I've just come back from my second trip to Iraq, and which, which caused me to an, uh, ask this question. The next president's going to have to deal, obviously, with Iraq. Uh, do you, uh, both you and Senator McCain have distinguished military records in combat. Do you think that gives him an, an would give him an advantage as commander in chief as an ex president? Uh, with the war? No, I don't think so. I think the American people, uh, I guess the polls indicate upwards of seventy percent of the American people think we're on the wrong course in uh, Iraq in even being there, and so uh, I, I think that. Um, the, the candidates are about equal on that question in terms of public appeal. Um, I, um, I, I, I actually wish they could, uh, that's one I wish they could thrash out in debates between themselves, but I, I think Senator Obama has a clear view that we've got to get out of Iraq, and he's willing to do it on a systematic carefully planned basis and in consultation with the senior military officers there. But uh, I, I think it's uh, the time has come to get out, and I think he'll make that clear during the, during the campaign. Yes, sir. Senator, I'm, excuse me, I'm Andy Glass. I work for Politico. Just as a historical aside, there was some shenanigans at that open convention that nominated you with Rick Stearns reversing the vote of the Credentials Committee and people like Bill Clinton working behind the scenes to get you the nomination on mm -hmm. the first ballot. But I have a question about 68. You talked about mistakes. Do you think it was a mistake to have the President of the United States uh, excluded from that convention? And on the other side of the coin, do you think it was a mistake for Vice President Humphrey not to break then and there with Lyndon Johnson on the war and to associate himself with 
the McCarthy Humphrey, I'm sorry, McCarthy Kennedy McGovern view that the war was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. Well, on the first question about excluding the president, I didn't know that President Johnson was excluded from that convention. This is, uh, this is a new bit of information I pick up this morning. Okay. I think that if he had requested uh, the right to be heard at the convention, uh, he'd have been given that. Well, he, his recollection was that he was told he wouldn't be welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a mistake if he was, if he was told that. Um, the, other, um, uh, the other question, yes, I think it was uh, a mistake for Hubert to stay with the administration position as long as he did. I talked to him about that several times, uh, both during the convention and afterwards, and he agreed with the compromise peace plank, as it was called, that was worked out by uh, Jean's, Jean McCarthy's delegates, the Kennedy delegates, which I then had, and also the Humphrey delegates. They worked out a, a reasonable proposal, and President Johnson rejected it, and Hubert felt he couldn't go against the administration. He was there as vice president and kind of a co-spokesman for the uh, administration. Um, we finally persuaded him when he got to Salt Lake City in the campaign, I think that was late in September, to make a break with the uh, uh, president. I think every indication was that he picked up new strength uh, after that, and as a matter of fact, uh, came very close to, to pulling a, a victory. So I think if he'd have done that earlier and hit it harder, the reason he didn't do that, as the President uh, Johnson had indicated to him, he'd have to withdraw his support if he raised any objection to the policy then being pursued. And he had gotten a commitment out of President Nixon, that he, uh, later President Nixon, then candidate Nixon, that he would not raise an objection to administration policy. So. Uh, Hubert was in a very tight squeeze from the president and pressure from the delegates, but I think the side of victory would have been on coming out against the war. Oh, one uh, last question. Uh, Ma'am. Thank you. My name is Anna Schott with Radio Valera Venezuela. I think there is a consensus among the candidates, presidential candidates, on the need of the recover or the renewing of, of uh, U.S. leadership in the world. What exactly would that mean for the rest of the world? Thank you. Well, just, uh, uh, just very uh, uh, quickly, that's one of the reasons I support Barack Obama. I think the moment he's sworn in, as president, our standing in the world is going to go up uh, dramatically. Uh, he voted, uh, he wasn't here to vote, he, he came out publicly against the war in Iraq uh, when he was still in uh, Illinois. Uh, he's spoken against it at various uh, times. That war is about as uh, popular as AIDS around the world. In, other capitals, and uh, it's hurt us a great deal, I think. There's almost no support for it anywhere. So I think there'll be an improvement there. I think also people around the world, most of whom are not white, are going to take a renewed sense of um, accomplishment in seeing a, a black man uh, in charge of the most powerful country uh, uh, around the world. I've always thought this is the greatest country in the world. I still think that. We have to be great because we make these enormous blunders like uh, Vietnam and Iraq and yet we survive. And uh, so we, uh, we have to be a great country and I think our founding documents are marvelous and we are a great country, but I don't think the world has seen that side of us much in the last uh, 
seven or eight years, and I think uh, it is time for a change. Senator McGovern, thank you for your uh, insights on 68 and 72 and your, uh, your thoughts about the current uh, election as well. We really appreciate having you. Thanks, uh, of course, to David Broder and Haynes Johnson and to Carrie O'Reilly of the uh, Newsmaker Committee uh, as well as Keith Hill and Joanne Booz uh, from the Press Club staff. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day.